He was Rome's imperator, commander of the forces, and even pater patriae, or father of the fatherland. But what Tiberius was not was Augustus. The people of Rome still revered Caesar Augustus as the man who brought peace, prosperity, and stability to a Rome that had been divided by six decades of civil turmoil. Every decision Tiberius made seemed to be compared with the actions of his predecessor. How could Tiberius possibly live up to the standard set by a god? To the Roman people, Augustus had been a symbol of unity and hope. Tiberius, on the other hand, with just two years in the curule chair, was seen as aloof, cold, and distant. Where Augustus had charmed the masses, Tiberius inspired only fear and suspicion. Upon his ascension, eight legions erupted in mutiny, four in Germania and four in Pannonia. This was not a complete surprise to Tiberius. The legions had begun grumbling about unpaid benefits and length of service even before Augustus had died. It was expected that they would use the transition to try and secure their aims. What did surprise Tiberius, however, was how the mutinies were resolved. Tiberius's biological son, Drusus, had dealt with the Pannonian legions through diplomacy, while Tiberius's trusted Praetorian, Sejanus, quietly ensured order was restored, without too much bloodshed. But the situation in Germania was far different. Tiberius's legal heir, Germanicus, with his natural charisma and military prestige, had crossed the line. It appeared as though Germanicus's actions served more than mere loyalty to Rome. Playing a dangerous game, Germanicus had forged a letter in Tiberius's name, presenting himself as the legion's saviour. And though he made a proper showing of publicly supporting Tiberius, Germanicus had failed to punish his legions for their rebellion against their emperor. Instead, he rewarded them by leading a campaign into Germania without consulting the Senate or Tiberius. To a man like Tiberius, who understood the fragility of power, it was clear. Germanicus's actions were not those of a subordinate. They were the actions of a man gathering loyalty and strength unto himself. That Germanicus's legions now adored him following his victories in Germania only deepened Tiberius's unease. As the son of Caesar Augustus, Tiberius knew all too well how easily men could rise on the backs of armies. And so, in order to stop any possibility of usurpation, Tiberius made a decision. It was time to separate Germanicus and his ambitious wife Agrippina from the legions on the Rhine. But that was a situation which needed to be handled very carefully. Tiberius couldn't just call Germanicus to Rome, at least not without raising the suspicion of eight legions stationed very close to Italy, legions who had already mutinied once. No, Germanicus needed to be brought home in glory. Let the whole city celebrate the conquest of Germania at the triumph of Germanicus. That was something the legions would allow. It would take only the slightest nudge for the Senate to grant the triumph. A strategically placed whisper to a few of Tiberius's freedmen would find its way to the ears of the senators many of whom had their own personal reasons to support Germanicus. They would not care that the conquest of Germania was incomplete, that the Germanic tribes had not been utterly destroyed, that Arminius still lived. None of that would matter. The Senate would celebrate him in triumph nonetheless. The Senate did as anticipated. When Germanicus's victorious legions made their way back to Koblenz following the Battle of Idistavisus, the Senate in Rome formally voted to grant him a triumph, scheduled for May 26th of the following year. This grand celebration of Germanicus's conquest of Germania would also mark the culmination of his term 
as Consul of Rome. As the city busied itself with preparations for the grand festivities, cleaning streets and temples, painting walls along the triumphal route, and constructing elaborate carts to showcase magnificent battle scenes, Tiberius was planning how to utilize his legal heir, without returning him to his legions on the Rhine. In the east, a delicate situation had arisen, one in which his mother, Julia Augusta, once again weaved her political web. The Kingdom of Armenia, a crucial buffer state between Rome and Parthia, had become a contested prize. Julia Augusta had discreetly thrown her influence behind a Parthian prince named Vonones, who claimed Armenia's throne with the alleged support of Rome. Venones, raised in Rome alongside his royal brothers as hostages of Caesar Augustus, had seized Armenia's throne after fleeing Parthia, where he had previously been installed as king by Augustus. However, the Parthians had little appetite for a Roman puppet, even if he was the son of their great king, Phryates. To ensure that Venones had a better chance of securing his position in Armenia, Julia Augusta used her influence with the Senate to orchestrate the appointment of Gnaeus Calpurnius Piso, the husband of her dear friend Plancina, as governor of Syria. With Piso so close, who would dare challenge Vonones? But Tiberius saw things differently. Vonones' presence threatened to align Armenia more closely with Parthia, rather than serving as a neutral buffer between the two great empires. Consequently, Tiberius needed to make a change, one that aligned with his vision for the Roman East. That was where Germanicus came in. As the triumph of Germanicus approached, the city buzzed with anticipation and excitement. Garlands of laurel and ivy adorned freshly scrubbed public buildings, arches and statues. Palm fronds, symbolising victory, were interspersed with colourful banners and flags marking the triumphal route. The Roman people, dressed in their finest, lined the streets, filling temple porticos and climbing rooftops for a better view of the impending spectacle. The main thoroughfare was meticulously prepared for the procession, lined with vibrant banners, statues of gods and personified virtues, and the Praetorian Guard, ensuring the parade's smooth passage through the crowds. Rome's senators and city magistrates were busy finalising their arrangements and preparing to join the parade as it passed by their homes. In the Forum Romanum, where Tiberius himself would sit, temporary seating was erected for the city's most distinguished guests. Rome was a city transformed. And why shouldn't she be? This was not merely a triumph, it was a celebration of Rome's glory, a showcase of the empire's might, glorified in the person of Tiberius's adopted heir, Germanicus. The crowds erupted in cheers as the procession began, their enthusiasm echoing through the streets. Wagons brimming with plundered treasures clattered by, showcasing the wealth seized from Germania. Following them were intricately designed floats that depicted the many triumphs of Germanicus, each scene a vivid tableau of victory and valour. As the floats passed, the crowd's anticipation grew, reaching a crescendo with the arrival of the captives. Towering barbarian warriors, clad in fearsome and elaborate attire, marched in chains. Their formidable presence and exotic garb awed the spectators, starkly contrasting with the refined Roman splendour surrounding them. Then came the highlight of the triumph. The legions selected by Germanicus to participate in the parade marched into the Forum Romanum. Dressed in full military regalia, they proudly displayed two of the three eagles lost in the Clades Variana. The first eagle had been recovered during Germanicus's assault on the Chatti, and the second was retrieved following the Battle of Idistavisus. 
However, as Germanicus's prize captive came into view, the crowd's excitement began to wane. There, in chains and heavily guarded, walked a solitary woman, clutching an infant. Thusnelda, the wife of Arminius, had given birth to her son, Thumelicus, while in Roman captivity. As Thusnelda clung to her child and proceeded toward the temple of Jupiter Capitolinus, where Rome's enemies were traditionally strangled at the conclusion of a triumph, the crowd's sympathy grew. They called out for Thusnelda and Thumelicus to be spared, murmuring about Germanicus's harsh treatment of Germania's women and children. Sitting on his elevated curule chair, Tiberius realized that even Germanicus, despite his immense popularity, was not beyond criticism. The public's pleas for mercy for Thusnelda and Thumelicus provided Tiberius with an opportunity to counteract his image as distant and unfeeling. Acting decisively, Tiberius ordered that Thusnelda and her son be spared the garrot and granted a pension to live out their lives in Rome. As the procession approached its climax, the crowd's fervour surged to a crescendo. Germanicus, resplendent in a gold-embroidered purple toga picta, appeared in his four-horse chariot, called a quadriga. The cheers and adulation of the Roman people swelled as he entered the Forum Romanum. Yet it was not merely the laurels of victory that captured the spectator's gaze. Germanicus's chariot was unusually packed, not with soldiers or a slave holding the symbolic laurel wreath above his head, but with his children, Drusus, Nero, Caligula, and even the two-year-old Agrippinilla. This sight, more than any float battle scene or pitiable captive, symbolized the future stability of Rome through the established lineage of its most celebrated general. As Germanicus rode past the elevated curule chair of the emperor, the sight of his chariot, filled with his progeny, irked Tiberius. The display was a powerful statement of family legacy and imperial promise for the future. But most of all, it was a subtle reminder that Tiberius lacked the legacy of grandsons to secure the future of his principate. Between the glorious histories of Augustus and Germanicus, Tiberius would eventually vanish.